Thank you all for coming down tonight. We are live from Books and Books in Coral Gables, Florida, through the generous support of the Knight Foundation. So a note to our internet audience watching at home, if you're interested in tonight's book, we could ship it to wherever you are in the U.S. free of charge. Just call the number on your screen. This evening, Books and Books is very happy to welcome Ms. Mia Alvar, <coughs> presenting her new story collection, In the Country. Ms. Alvar was born in Manila and grew up in Bahrain and New York City. She received an MFA in fiction writing from Columbia University and a BA from Harvard College. Her short fiction has appeared in One Story, The Missouri Review, Five Chapters, and The Cincinnati Review, among other publications. Her work has been cited for distinction in the Best American Short Stories and has been nominated twice for the Pushcart Prize. Tonight, Ms. Alvar is going to be in conversation with our friend Ms. Evelina Galang. Ms. Galang is the director of the Creative Writing Program at the University of Miami and the author of the books Her Wild American Self, One Tribe, and Angel de la Luna and the Fifth Glorious Mystery. Please welcome Mia and Evelina. So good evening, everyone. Hi. I think that Mia would like to, you want to start by maybe doing a little bit of reading? Sure. Um, I was just going to read from the first story in the collection. Um, and, and thank you guys so much for having me. It's really nice to be here. Um, my, my hosts, Greg and Kathy, who invited me to be a visiting writer at their school, um, mentioned books and books early on and um, I haven't stopped hearing about it since then so it's so nice to be in a space you know in such a beautiful city but uh, but in a space that means so much to so many people who live here um, so um, I was gonna read from uh, just the beginning of the first story called uh, the Contravida and um, this collection has nine stories in it um, all um, kind of focused on uh, experiences of migration and dislocation and movement between the Philippines and the Middle East and the U.S., which is where I, uh, which are the places where I grew up. And um, this story uh, is one of the few in the collection that deal with actually coming back and what that experiences like after being away for a while. Um, so I'm just going to read the start of that story. My mother was waiting in front of our house when I rode up in a taxi. There you are, she said, as if we'd simply lost each other for an hour or two at a party. I only half embraced her, afraid she might break if I held too tight. She hadn't been able to collect me from the airport herself. Years ago, my father had forbidden her to drive, though I supposed he could do little to prevent it now. Let me, she said, reaching for my suitcase. I waved her away. I would no sooner allow my mother to carry my suitcase than allow her to carry me. Oh, Steve, she protested, you don't know my strength. She dropped her arms flattening the palms against her lap, a habit I remembered well. Throughout my childhood, she often looked to be drying her hands on an apron, whether or not she was wearing one. In the decades since I left, she hadn't aged exactly. To my eyes, she seemed not older, but more. More frail, more tired, softer spoken, her dark, teaspoon-shaped face cast farther down. Every feature I remembered had settled in her and been more deeply confirmed. My parents still lived in Mabini Heights, a suburb of Manila and monument to a time when they belonged to the middle class. My father had called himself an import-export businessman before sliding through the years down a spiral of unrelated jobs each more menial than the last and harder for him to keep. And my mother had been a nurse, 
before he banned her from working outside the house altogether. But if they'd come down in the world, so had Mabini Heights. Ever since my childhood in the 70s, when so much of that middle class fled Marcos and martial law, houses had been left unfinished or carved up for different uses. Squatters set up camp amid the scaffolding and roofless rooms. Families took in boarders or relatives. Our house had changed too. On its right, a gray, unpainted cinder block cell had been added, taking up what used to be a yard. My parents had cemented over the grass and built this Sari Sari store five years earlier, selling snacks and other odds and ends through a sliding wicket to people on the street. The Sari Sari compromised what I imagine was the dream of my parents, who grew up poor, a green buffer between the world and their world. The addition seemed to shrink the main house to a toy, its windows tiny, and its clay roof something storybook elves might have built. Next to it, I felt gigantic. I hunched my shoulders as I followed my mother inside. I was convinced, walking behind her, that the dishes on the shelves were rattling. Papa's in here, said my mother, opening the door to my old bedroom. The blast of cold came as a shock, then a relief. There was an air conditioner now in the window under which I used to sleep as a child, and my old bed, where my father lay, was pushed into a corner. I saw from the straw mat rolled up beside him that my mother had been sleeping on the floor at night. Otherwise, the room was clean and bare and quiet as I remembered. Same white cinder block walls, same wood tiled floors, same smell of mothballs from the same chest of drawers. If all faded a little, like an old photograph. My mother kept a tidy house, a trait we shared, and things probably lasted longer in her care. Two oxygen tanks stood beside my father's bed. He breathed through a tube. The sight of him brought me back to New York, where I lived, and to the hospital where I worked as a clinical pharmacist. My father no longer resembled me. The short boxer's physique, a bullish muscularity I'd always detested sharing with him, was gone. In fact, he no longer resembled anyone in the family. He belonged now to that transnational tribe of the sick and the dying. Without the dentures he'd worn most of his adult life, my father's mouth was a pit, a wrinkled open wound below the nose. What I could see of his eyes, under lids that were three quarters closed, did not appear to see me back. He looked not only thin, but vacuum dried, desiccated, less a human than the prehistoric remains of one. He groaned, a low and heavy sound. All right, Papa, all right. My mother took a brown dropper bottle from a chair next to the bed. This used to hold him for a while, she said, but lately he's complaining round the clock. Steadying his chin, she released a dose of liquid, liquid morphine into his mouth with a dainty caution of a woman ladling hot soup or lighting a church candle. He let out another groan. Shh. She stroked the sides of his face. Even bedridden and in pain, my father had managed to preserve their old arrangement. Whenever he called, she was there to wait on him. I had predicted this and how much I would hate to watch. In my suitcase, I carried an answer. Sucarol was the newest therapy for chronic pain on the market in America. White and square, the size of movie ticket stubs, Sucarol patches adhered to the skin releasing opiates much stronger than morphine. Doctors had just started prescribing them to terminal patients in New York. Sucarol could take years to reach the Philippines, a country whose premier pharmacy chain boasted 
Laging bago ang gamot dito as its tagline. We do not sell expired drugs here. Still, something kept me from unpacking the patches right then. I did not want my mother to see my hands shaking, to know what I had done to bring them here in the first place, let alone the price I'd pay if anyone found out. Is that better, Papa? My mother returned the morphine to the chair next to a rosary, a spiral notebook, a folded white hand fan. She logged the dose into the notebook like the nurse she'd once been. I picked up the fan and opened it, rib by wooden rib. Its lace edge had frayed, but the linen pleats remained bright and clean. I remembered sitting in her lap as a child during Sunday Mass while she flicked her wrist back and forth to cool me with it. She'd brought my father to the doctor eight months before when he had trouble breathing and couldn't finish a meal without hunching over in pain. His belly had grown to the size of a watermelon and, from the veins straining against the skin, nearly as green. When my mother called me in New York and said, liver cancer, I imagined my parents as clearly as if I'd been sitting in the free clinic with them. I saw my father shrug or grunt each time the doctor addressed him, as proud and stubbornly tongue-tied as he always became around people with titles and offices. I saw my mother frown in concentration and move her lips in time with the doctors as if that would help her understand. I saw her dab the corners of my father's mouth with a white handkerchief she always carried in her purse. Because of his age and his refusal, even after this diagnosis, to stop drinking, he never qualified for a transplant. At my mother's request, I wired money into a Philippine national bank account that I kept open for the family. Whenever someone needed rent or medicine or tuition back home, I sent what I could, having no wife or children of my own to support. In my father's case, I thought about refusing, but it occurred to me a relative might say he could get better care in America. His coming to New York for treatment and staying with me, or worse, in the hospital where I made my living, was something I'd have wired any sum to avoid. When chemotherapy did not stop the cancer's spread to his lungs, when radiation did not shrink the masses, my father's doctor began to speak in a code we both understood pain management instead of treatment, not recovery, but comfort in his last days. My money turned from doxorubicin and radiotherapy to oxygen tanks, air conditioning, the dark brown bottle of morphine. Still, I expected my father to survive. For all the years I'd spent wishing him dead, it was my mother's role in the family, drama, not his, to suffer. Esteban has got some heavy hands, the family always said. Loretta is a saint. When she called to tell me end stage, my mother may as well have said we'd never lived under a clay roof in Mabini Heights, that I remembered my entire childhood wrong. Thanks. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. Thank you for writing such a beautiful collection of stories. And, um, and especially, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit about it um, earlier. This book is very much a book about the diasporic Filipino, right? The, we're, we're everywhere. The, the community is everywhere. And, and in this particular story in Contravida, it is the story of someone going home, mm -hmm. right? After being gone a very long time. And it seems, I think, as we read further into the story, that he's not feeling quite at home. Mm -hmm. Things are different, and, right. and he's gotten used to the life in, in the U.S. I was wondering, I was reading a little bit about where the story began and how it has some origin in, in personal experience, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and then also talk about how personal experience takes that leap into fiction and how, how we do that as writers. Yeah, well, um, to give you a little bit of the background that 
Evelina was referring to. And thank you so much for doing this with me and having this conversation with me. Such a pleasure. Me. I'm a big admirer. Um, so um, the, the, story, the story is actually the oldest one in the collection. And I had started writing it after a visit to the Philippines. I had been away for about as long as Steve, the character in the, in the story. Um, and I had gone back for a similar reason. My grandmother was sick and um, most likely about to pass away. And so family from all over made the trip. And uh, before this trip, I had not written a lot of fiction. I thought I sort of fancied myself a poet and um, and while I was on the trip, I also didn't. I had no intention of using these experiences in any way, um, even in poetry. I, I but I did. Um, I was just so arrested by these kind of details and experiences that must have been normal when I was younger, but um, were completely new to me after ten years away. Um, so some of the rituals around uh, death and dying that made their way into the story eventually. Um, and when I kind of went back to my normal life in, you know, my normal college senior life in the US, I, um, I started thinking about it, um, thinking about this material and I, and I thinking about what I might do with it. Um, and it was also around the same time that I was sort of looking for myself in fiction, um, not finding a lot of um, Filipino diasporic or immigrant voices um, you know, on my shelves, or at least on the syllabi that had been um, kind of created for me. Um, and I had to kind of go, go looking for people like Evelina and Jessica Hagedorn and, and the people who were sort of doing it first and first publishing these stories in, in the 90s. And, um, and, you know, and there were also a, a lot of um, kind of great debut short story collections coming out around that time that focused on the immigrant experience in, in different communities like Juno Diaz's book, Drown and Jhumpa Lahiri's book, uh, Interpreter of Maladies. And um, I started to sort of think about my family's experience as literary material for the first time, or fictional material for the first time. And um, the thing that I learned is that it's not very, um, I mean, speaking of the leap from memory and ex personal experience to fiction, uh, my grandmother was a very beloved person, <laughs> and um, it, it's not, um, it's very interesting to, to be around a beloved person in real life and, um, and enjoy them and enjoy their company, but it's not the most interesting thing in fiction. Um, so I ended up kind of incorporating a lot of those details that I had witnessed in the Philippines, but um, kind of reversing uh, you know, the kind of person who had died, um, I think clearly even from what I had read, um, Esteban in this story is not someone who Steve is going to mourn in the same way as, um, as I mourned my grandmother. And, um, and you need that kind of tension. conflict or yeah. tension in fiction, so. Yeah. I, and you know, one of the things I thought was really interesting too in, in Contrabida, right? So it's the opening, it's the opening story in the collection, and we've been reading in my workshop first stories and collections and mm. first chapters, and talking about ways writers really teach the reader how to read the book in those opening pages mm. and introduce them to a world that they may or may not be used to. And so you've got you've got um, Steve going back, and in some cases, in some way being a foreigner in his, own, in his own homeland, right? As a way of introducing a wider readership to, to, the, to the rest of the book. I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about that, how, how that first story um, invites, invites readers into the, into the world that you have created, um, and not necessarily in just this story, but in all the stories. 
Um, yeah, well, the, this first story, I, I knew I wanted to be the first story for a long time. I felt like it kind of pulled in a lot of the ideas that recur throughout the book and f in that way felt like a good introduction to the rest of the stories. Mm -hmm. So it's not only about um, diaspora and, and migration and homecoming, although, you know, kind of troubled homecoming, but it's also about just um, kind of um, roles that we assign uh, each member our, of our families and the ways in which we sometimes live up to those roles and sometimes um, kind of go off script. So, um, you know, and there's a little bit of um, just kind of the aftermath of, of the 70s and 80s um, politics in the Philippines, which um, runs throughout the book as well. Um, yeah, it, it felt um, sort of representative in that way. Yeah, some of the students um, in my class were talking about how also then it brings a reader who's not familiar with the culture into the world um, side by side with Stephen, you know, with Steve, mm -hmm. and, and seeing things for, the, for them the first time, but it, um, it felt like they had a guide bringing them into the world. And, and I thought it was also interesting because as the stories progress, we, um, there's more... Um, uh, the, there's a more familiarity with culture, the Filipino culture, and in the story Shadow Families, right? Mm -hmm. So now you've got like, um, I think I really, there's a way that I really connected to that material and enjoyed um, enjoyed the community that you, it, and that story takes place in Bahrain, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's about two different, it's about two different um, communities within the Filipino American or the Filipino community there. Right. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about. It felt like a story about community that you know, and, and and clearly that would not work as well, or maybe it would as the first story. But it seems that by the time we get to that story, there's a way we're we're um, really into the culture, the a, a voice and and a, and a a way of being that. Um, if you're not if you're not part of that culture, you're you're ready for it by the time you get to Shadow Families. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I think there was probably a hesitation on my part to start with a story set in Bahrain, yeah. because there's, um, I think American readers now are, because of all these other um, wonderful books that have come out about the immigrant experience, I think in a way they're, there's, they're somewhat trained to read about like a very simple kind of east to west <laughs> movement. Yeah. Um, and kind of can recognize that and um, and classify it in a way that um, you know the movement of Filipinos from one a one East Asian country to a Middle Eastern Asian country is less um, kind of familiar and yeah. less um, identifiable. Right. Um, so yeah, I guess I mean I think it would have set a different tone, maybe not a worse tone, but mm -hmm. um, it, it maybe would, and, and Shadow Families is also one, I, I tell it from a, from that community's sort of collective um, first person, plural, is it yeah. collective, yeah. <laughs> first person plural point of view, um, and, uh, and so that f felt like also another kind of not immediately um, relatable um, gesture that maybe needed to happen later on. Yeah, and, and, the, and for me reading that story, there, in some ways there, um, that, that community felt so familiar to me. Mm -hmm. Those women, I, 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 I hear their voices in my own mind and I've, I've seen them and I've entered those communities. And yet it was also very, um, very um, specific to where they were. Um, and and so, did you want to talk a little bit about about that those that community there? Yeah, um, sure. I wish I um, I almost feel underqualified to talk about it, having lived there for only four years as a child. <laughs> and so my you know my, I don't have these kind of strong statements to make about it. Um, I I do know like I I always appreciated the kind of contradictions and, and paradoxes about living there 
in in one sense it was this sort of international utopia there were people from um from south asia from from the far east from you know from the united kingdom people from all over living in in one tiny island nation and yet it was very easy for them to only socialize with the people from their country mm -hmm. and um and it's even kind of mapped out that way there are a lot of um you know, gated communities or, or compounds that people live in where, um, you know, their neighbors are all um, expats from the same country. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it, in, in that way, it, it felt like a very kind of um, uh, pleasant experience, but also kind of um, mysterious, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, and, and that story, Shadow Families, I focused on that whole phenomenon of clinging to the people who come from your country, whom you might not associate with in the home country, or who might occupy a very different social class, but um, sort of become your friends and compatriots until, <laughs> as long as it's comfortable. Um, you know, and then until story. something else, you know, kind of creates another sort of tension. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your process, where your stories come from. Um, are they character-based, first, image, situation? Do they stem from, like, in Contra Vida, it comes from um, some experience. But I know that there's a lot of, there's a lot of history, and mm -hmm. we're talking a little bit about this politics and, and um, class consciousness throughout the story. So there's some research that goes with that, too. So yeah. um, where did the stories come from for you? And, and how do you see them from that first moment, that, that little seed, to, to what we've got here? Because I hear that you also write many, many pages. That these stories were much longer than they, are, than they actually appear in the book. Yeah. Um, yeah, it sort of varied with every story for me. Um, so in in the country, I knew I wanted sort of is an example of one that started as a char started with characters. I knew I wanted it to be about this family um, and what they go through uh, under martial law in the Philippines. Um, you know, um, s some of them are are sort of inspired by uh, just little anecdotes or um, things I hear. I, I guess they, most, they mostly start with characters. Baby and Shadow Families, I think, is sort of a composite of women I've known growing up who were sort of the ones gossiped about by the majority of women. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, Legends of the White Lady, that one is kind of a, was inspired by Claire Danes, the actress, <laughs> going yeah. going on a trip to Manila and and really hating it, um, and being quite vocal about it, being very vocal about it in a way yeah. that upset a lot of people. Still not over um, it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, so um, yeah, I guess the, I guess they generally start with a person and and uh, either an anecdote or. Mm -hmm. Or some sort of memory, and then and then you sit down and start writing, and pages and pages and pages come out. Um, I, I wouldn't say they like flow out of my <laughs> pen like <laughs> like like honey. Um, I you know I think I think I do end up writing a lot of pages. Um, just but but they're all pages of me kind of working my thoughts out, and right. when I look back at them, they're. Um, they really are very often the same sentence written over and over and over in different, in different ways, ways. and yeah. I and I'm, it, it just it really looks like a crazy person's, um, you know, ranting and ravings, but um, but somehow that's uh, necessary for me to get to what I'm actually trying to say. Yeah, and your next project is a novel. Yes, um, so I'm writing a novel that. Um, I'm not supposed to say is a sequel, but um, is takes a character from the title story in this collection and follows her life after okay. the events there. Um, let's see. I saw 
that um, in an interview someone asked you where your stories fell, like in this continuum of you know art for art's sake or stories to change the world, to like be a, the representation of all Filipinos in the whole wide world, right? And and you had said at that in that interview that you felt like it, you were somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. That it's not really all there, all art for art's sake or to change the world, but obviously literature does change the world and the way it lives with its readers, right? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you still feel that way, if it, it's still in the middle, or if, if, or if your views have changed and, and what you think about that. Especially, you know, as you, we were talking earlier, there, there weren't that many Filipino-American writers um, in the canon mm -hmm. as we were um, going through our education here in the U.S. And so yeah. there are more and more now. Um, and so there's a tendency to, you know, people see, oh, a Filipino-American writer, I want to glom on to you, and I want you to represent all of us. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so where do you feel the work lies now in that continuum? Well, I, I don't think they're art for art's sake um, purely. I mean, I, I think there's no way I would have started even writing these stories if I felt like, um, if I felt adequately represented at, you know, at my local bookstore um, growing up. And so there was always that motivation for me as I was starting to write fiction seriously was, you know, wanting to write the book that, um, that I wanted to find in the bookstore. And, um, you know, and which is not the same as saying there were no writers writing <laughs> about Filipino Americans and Filipinos um, in English or, or in the United States because there were, but there was this problem of access. I really, um, as I'm sure you did, I really had to work hard to find even the most um, kind of prolific and the most popular of these writers. Um, they, they just, you know, um, people, the people kind of curating my reading and, 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 um, and the people I would, I would just see and hear talked about um, weren't, they weren't among them. And um, so I, I, I don't think that instinct will ever be, um, I, I don't, I can't see myself ever feeling like, you know, I'm done, yeah. you know, yeah. it's, it's um, <coughs> like, it's, it's over, it's, um, we're, you know, we're adequately represented in the canon. Um, and so in that way, I feel, um, I feel, a, 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 you know, more than an artistic motivation. But I also think that, um, you know, in terms of changing the world, um, I also think that I, I, I'm with most fiction writers in that the goal is always to kind of get you to um, get you to identify or empathize with uh, people that you may not have before, um, mm -hmm. and I think that most injustice happens because of kind of pigeonholing and and stereotyping and categor categorizing, and and I feel like good fiction tries to do the opposite of that. Um, so if I feel any kind of political motivation, it's, it's more sort of generalized in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I would have to agree. It's, um, I think, you know, for my own self, um, you start out, you just want to, I would just wanted to write a good story, mm -hmm. you know, and I had no idea that um, once the stories got out there that you would have young readers identifying in a way who were looking for their work are looking for themselves uh, in the pages of a book. You know, mm -hmm. you don't think about those things. Um, well, I didn't think about those things. And mm -hmm. then when you start to see it emerging, you know, and you start to get um, readers responding to the work because they see themselves, it's kind of an amazing thing. It is amazing. And I, I always have kind of like this complicated response to an email like that because I'm like, oh, that's so great that, that you know, you're telling me this is the first time you're encountering yourself in fiction, but let me recommend all these other people who have been doing it, you know, for yeah. much longer than me, and and you know, and who you will enjoy just as much. And um, so I, I I think that kind of that access and that visibility is still still an issue. So, yeah. 
you know, um, right before we started, I, I, I said to you, you know, we have the same moment in each of our books. <laughs> There's this moment, right? And, um, and, and it's, it takes place in 1986, mm -hmm. in February of 1986, when it's the Archbishop, right? Is it the Archbishop? Who, yeah. says, who says, go to the streets, pray tonight. I can't remember the exact quote, but it, it's this moment. And it was a moment for each of us in our fiction. Mm -hmm. Why did you choose it? And, and, and can you talk about, because I think it, it's, it's an important moment um, that we, I don't, I've never talked about it in history class, I've mm -hmm. never talked about it in the family, but somehow when I was digging up my own fiction, there was that moment. And yeah. when I saw it in your book, I thought, yeah, that's a really important <laughs> moment. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, it's almost, when it comes to the revolution that happened in the Philippines in 1986, which deposed Ferdinand Marcos, who had been um, declaring himself president for the past uh, uh, two decades, um, or more than two decades, it, 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 it's almost, um, it's really hard to even choose what moments to include because it's such a, it's such a made for fiction moment in history. There was so much drama around yeah. that revolution and, and so many moments that you like, I feel like wouldn't survive a creative writing workshop because people because they happened, but people would be like that. That seems really unlikely, like the fact that there were two swearing ins happening at the same time right. um, by the two people who claimed they had won the presidential election. Of course, we get pretty close to that here in the United States. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, so yeah, I had to. I, I think um, you know I was glad to have my editor around to kind of rein me in and, and say like, well, maybe this sort of super dramatic, unlikely moment and maybe not this other one. And that happened to be one that made it in. But mm -hmm. um, I also think that um, sometimes when I look back at, at, at these stories, it's, um, I wrote the stories over such a long period of time that it's hard to parse like how much of this I actually came up with <laughs> and how much of it is, you know, um, suggested by the reading that I was doing at the time or the, um, you know, my own memories. Are they my own memories? Are they my parents' and grandparents' memories that have been passed on to me? Um, are they from history? Are they from books that have kind of dramatized and, and over-dramatized that history? Mm -hmm. um, so. I don't know what come what comes out of all the en out of the end of all that research feels very um, hard to hard to trace. Yeah. I guess, and, and yeah. I don't know if you feel it the all, same yeah, way. Yeah, no, I think it, it it ends up blurring because what is dream, what is memory, what is truth, yeah. and it all serves for that the capital T truth, right? Like mm -hmm. whatever the story is that you're trying to get at, and I I always feel like it ends up being. Um, that's where the fiction comes in because you, it's like this pot and you're mixing part memory, part research, part, mm -hmm. you know, um, just imagination, the, the act of imagination and claiming it as your own material um, with a particular voice. I don't think you can really parse it out. I think that's what makes the magic in the story. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and your work certainly has a lot of magic to it and I'm so grateful for the book. I wondered if um if do you, if we were going to have questions from the audience maybe sure was is Victor you guys have were we going to do questions from our audience <laughs> yes Adam <laughs> so I obviously you didn't sit down and write one story at one sitting so I'm curious about your creative process in taking on the persona of the person you're writing from the, in the, this story it's the first person mm -hmm. you're writing from Esteban's point of view. Can you talk about that creative process of getting into his, into his being to write the story? Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so I, uh, that's a great question. Um, I found it really difficult to write from um, Steve's point of view um, for many reasons. <laughs> um, I'm not a clinical pharmacist or a man, um, and m many other things. I think I have a less troubled relationship with my own father. But, um, but I, um, 
I try to uh, get as method about it sometimes as possible. Um, you know, I wasn't, not as far as some writers go. I, I, I feel like there are writers who would actually like enroll in like a clinical pharmacy program and, and, or like shadow a clinical pharmacist around. And I can't, I can't, I can't do that. But, um, but yeah, with, with Steve or with any of the other characters, particularly the ones who were kind of removed from my own experience, um, like I'm thinking of um, this one character in the story called uh, Esmeralda, who's the title character, and she's, um, she cleans um, houses and offices for a living. And um, I, in that case, I, I, I you know, I, I tried to enter into her life as much as possible, even um, even in areas that I knew wouldn't make it into the story. So I tried to kind of figure out what her commute would be every day, and I tried to take that a couple of times. I knew um, I knew which church she attended because it was the church that kind of that she slept in her first night in. Um, in New York because she decided on, on like a last minute impulse not to leave. Um, she's supposed to go back to the Philippines, but she decided to stay. Um, and, and, as, and so I knew which church in Lower Manhattan was, um, and, and I spent some time like sitting in that church and, and thinking about like the exact spot where she would have fell, mm -hmm. fallen asleep and where the priest like kind of approached her and then offered her a job. So um, yeah, the more kind of, um, removed or challenged I feel by a character who's not like me the more I try to kind of just get in their bodies a little bit and um, know as much as I can uh, even if it doesn't um, even if it doesn't end up in the story any other questions other questions is this all short stories in that book it's um it's eight short stories and then there's a ninth that's a very very long short story or a novella depending on what you want to call it um but yeah we call them it, stories how long it took you to write i think it took me about 10 years and change um but it's a little hard to measure because yeah, you know yeah, yeah how much of this uh, how much of the work was generated in your mfa program Ooh. For my MFA Let's students. Let's look at the table of contents <laughs> and yeah. see. Um, actually, most of them, except for two, uh -huh. at least originated as a draft in an, MF, in an MFA workshop. Uh huh. But um, probably none of them look anything like they did in in yeah. the MFA. <laughs> workshop which is a good thing yeah, yeah and you know it's really funny I was it leads me to this question because um, having the stories workshop I had stories workshop where I was using Tagalog mm -hmm. in in the work and um, there were always different responses to that you know whether it was can you put a glossary of terms or why can't you just say cheese smith is gossip say it in English mm -hmm. um, all everything from whitewashing it to uh, wanting to exoticize it even more so than just having it be part of the dialogue or the world that, that's um, in the story yeah. um, for you in using Tagalog in this book um, can you talk a little bit about the choices you made and how to represent it and how to, to play out because like for example Juno you know Juno will just it's just like out there and he's He's yeah. effing around with people, and he's got like you know footnotes, and he's not you know he's not going to play around with it. And um, and I know like it, my last book, they wanted a glossary of terms, and I said, I'll give you an essay about why there is no glossary of terms. <laughs> so it's, so it's called in context or why there is no glossary of terms in the back of the book. That's For nice. you, what did you have to go through with um, Kanaf to to get the Tagalog in there? Um, so I, I went back and forth a little bit, especially you know since Juno was such a Juno's first book, especially was such a you know mm -hmm. keystone for me. Um, and I at fir I first I did not want to italicize the Tagalog words. Um, I I sort of got a little feedback from people wanting them italicized, and um, and theoretically I still think. Um, 
they are italicized in the book. I still think that um, it, it doesn't quite represent the way Filipinos incorporate Tagalog and English together. Um, I mean, Taglish. Yeah, nothing's italicized when you're, you know, talking to your mom or your cousins. Um, but you know, and and same with, um, you know, say, but. I decided that I, I was okay with having sort of recognizable scaffolding for people. Um, and, uh, you know, there was, I guess there was enough in the stories that felt Filipino to me that I felt like, um, you know, being explicit about the fact that something was Tagalog was not, um, was not othering it too much. Yeah. Um, and same with, um, you know, same with scaffolding, like quotation marks, you know, I, um, I, I, I enjoy stories that, that don't use them at all. And, and it mm -hmm. makes perfect sense to me why they wouldn't, because um, speech and thought are not always so separate. Right. But, um, but I don't know, I, I, I I decided to use what was available to me, in, in some cases, what was available to me to kind of help the reader along uh, without spoon feeding. So I do feel like a glossary is, is spoon feeding. Yeah, glossary spoon um, feeding. So, yeah, yeah, I think I've been having this argument with editors, you know, because I, I feel pretty strongly, but I will not any, no more. I mean, I think in Her Wild American Self, um, mm. uh, that was the last book that Coffee House actually put italicized um, words for, for non-English words. And mm -hmm. they felt like, I remember the conversation that I had with Alan Kornblum at the time, felt like it disrupted the, the look of the text, the flow of the text, to have like, you know, text, 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 oh, italicized words. Mm. And for me, as, as um, I've gone on, to, um, to develop the use of Tagalog just as a natural part of the story. You know, it's, a, it's an organic part of my character's world. So what I oftentimes tell um, editors is, it's, for my characters, those are not foreign words. For my characters, it's a part of their world. Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, so I, I kind of, that's like the one stand I take. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great, yeah, yeah, no, it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> like that. Devastating. Devastating. Or if I should leave my MFA program right yeah. now? No. <laughs> I mean, you see both sides. I'm in yeah. MFA program, so just sort of experiencing you know, everything that can happen in a, in a classroom. Yeah. There was, I mean, there was a lot of really smart feedback, but I think, um, I think I, I think part of being in an MFA program is kind of learning who your readers are and you know what which bits of feedback are useful to you um, so I, I I feel like there's also like a, a time kind of um, element to the usefulness of MFA feedback I, I felt like the the first year and a half or so of workshops were like meteorically um, helpful to me and then by, by the fourth or fifth workshop, I was kind of like, um, okay, uh, here we are again. But, um, and, and, you know, and after coming out of an MFA, um, it does take a while, uh, just to warn you, it does take a while to kind of turn off that, those like 12 voices or, or whatever, like 12 imaginary voices saying, you know, what is this character's motivation? Like, I don't know. So, you know, it takes a while to kind of write in that space of like independent imagination again. But, but I think that's part of the, the kind of training and the process of being a writer is that a lot of people are going to tell you what they think. And, um, and you don't always have to, to listen. Um, so, but, but it was useful because it forced me to think about, you know, a lot of the things that Evelina was asking. Um, you know, some readers just really 
really can't handle more than two countries in one story, for instance. They're like, where are we? Are, isn't this a Filipino immigrant coming to the United States? Like, what is, um, you know, what is Bahrain doing in here? And what is, you know, what are these other countries? And why does she have a to? Spanish name? Yeah, yeah. So, and, and you know, and, and it's useful to have to think about those things, whether or not you, you end up um, giving them what they want. Um, is there any difference or uh, you don't notice anything or they say you're presenting us, is it accurate, is it inaccurate, what are you doing? Yeah, well, my answer might change in about a month's <laughs> time because I'm going to the Philippines uh, for the first time with a book and um, I get to kind of chat with readers there. So I am interested in, in how some of these stories will like survive a, a fact check or an accuracy check, like you said. I'm sure there will be many people there who... Um, who will be very supportive. Yeah, no, but I mean, <laughs> but who have, you know, maybe a stronger claim on some of these events than, um, you know, than somebody who grew up in the Middle East and the States. But, um, but here in this country from Filipino Americans, it's been, um, it's been less critical um, than from anyone else. Um, I think there's a, there's a kind of, Pinoy pride <laughs> phenomenon that happens when um, when a group of people is just so hungry to see a Filipino, any Filipino, anyone who who they feel represents their culture, like up on a bookshelf or or in a magazine or something like that. That um, you know, frankly, I'm sometimes uncomfortable uh, about it because I'm, I'm I'm happy that they're kind of proud and supportive, but um, sometimes I wonder if they've read the stories, <laughs> um, you know, because, uh, you know, these, the stories are not, you know, making heroes or saints out of um, Filipinos. Um, and, uh, you know, but that's not, um, we don't really talk about that part. My, my family, for instance, I, I think, thinks, I don't, you know, I don't, aside from my mom who's read it like, three times or something. Um, my family just thinks of it as, as a celebration of Filipino culture. So they read about <coughs> karaoke parties and, and food fiestas and, and think, oh, that's us. And, um, and this book is a celebration of us, um, which is great. It makes my life easier. But um, Do you think it's a critique of us as well? Do I think this book is a critique of us? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a critique or a celebration. I just think it's a um, book of stories. <laughs> yeah, I just think it's a kind it's of like creative. fictional meditation or, or exploration. And I feel like any exploration of human beings brings up the good and the bad. And you so. want the complicated. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I was wondering out of all the stories, why In the Country is the one that became a novella and is going to become a novel. What, what about that particular story did you, you couldn't stop? You wanted to keep going. Well, part of the reason it became a novella is that it covers a 16-year period. Is that right? 14-year period, 15. Um, and I think that there are awesome writers out there who can cover a 14-year period in, you know, 14 words. Um, I am definitely not one of them. And it started out as kind of like a very short, impressionistic story told from the point of view of a child observing her parents during martial law. Um, but then I just needed more and more space to kind of accommodate for all the things that happened in that, in that period. So it just kept lo getting longer and longer. Um, and then the reason it became a novel is that I just wasn't done with um, Milagros, the main character. I was just, I kept feeling interested in her and what her choices would be after. Is she, is she based on someone you know or several people? Yeah, I think she's sort of a composite. I mean, I think there are versions of her throughout the collection as well. Um, 
I, there's a lot of her that I borrowed from people like my mother. Um, you know, this kind of um, very upwardly mobile immigrant Filipina, educated in a way that um, that felt like a, a a way to kind of climb out of her class station in in the Philippines, um, and and successful at that. Um, <coughs> But maybe you know, dealing with um, with a lot of other complications as well. So um, so yeah, she's based on my mother and a lot of kind of um, middle class Filipina immigrants who grew up poor that I know. All right. Can I ask one last question? <laughs> uh, because you know what, um, yeah, you may not, not know this, but, but October is Filipino American History Month. Right. And so since I've got me here. Or as some people like to call it, a Hug a Filipino Month. Yes, which <laughs> hug you, a can Filipino do, American you can buy a book month. and then hug a Filipino. But I was wondering if we, we could take this moment to share, who do you think, um, a list of as many Filipino American writers out there that people can take a look at if they haven't already done it. So Jessica Hagedorn is one that we talked about. Mm -hmm. Lisley, Who else? Lisley Tenorio is one of my most recent favorites. He wrote a story collection called Monstrous. Yes. Highly recommend. Um, Alex Gilvery wrote a great novel. Uh, who else? Zach Lindmark. Zach Lindmark. Osmore Lindmark. Yep. Yeah. Who excellent. Else? Um, you can name poets, too. I'll say Patrick Rosal, mm -hmm. Oliver de la Paz. No, I can't. I, you do it. Because <laughs> if I forget someone, I'll go get mad. Yeah, Joseph Legaspi, uh, Rico Siasoko. I, am I am I butchering yes. his last name? Lara Stapleton. Um, yeah. Gina yeah. Postol. Mm -hmm. If we forget anyone, it's because we're running out of time, right? Exactly. <laughs> but it's it's this is an amazing opportunity to talk to you and to share and celebrate your book, which is um, complicated and character driven and engrossing and um, a great thing, a great book to add to the canon of contemporary literature, American literature, but most certainly Filipino American literature. So thank you for thank you for, to Books and Books for allowing me this conversation, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for being here. All right, folks, so we do have In the Country as well as Evelina's books for sale at the counter in the front room over there. Mia will be signing over there at the table to the left of the two stools. I want to thank our special guest interviewer, Evelina Galang, and please give another hand to Mia Alvar. Thank you very much. <laughs> Buy a book, give a hug. <laughs>